happiness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Welcome. Next week, one of the things we're hoping to do is possibly start meeting again in person, live. We're pretty excited about that possibility. There are some restrictions. If you're not comfortable showing up yet, that is totally okay. Uh, if you want to show up wearing a mask, that's fantastic. If you have a mustache now, that's totally good too. We take all kinds of people. They all will work. Um, it, but if you are not comfortable, please stay home. Um, we want to work within your comfort level. We want to be able to worship. We're still going to be providing the video. So uh, you can sign up on our email. Make sure you're a part of that because we're going to be sending out announcements how we're going to do this, what's going to be happening. Should I do that whole thing again? I don't think it'll be... Yeah. No, don't do it again. No, it wasn't for that. <laughs> it's for me. I don't know that I... I'm like, man, I'm rambling already. <laughs> no, nah, we're going with it. We're alive. <laughs> we're alive. There's no double takes here. 
Good morning. Welcome to the Bridge Church. I want to start in the book of Isaiah. We're starting in verse uh, 19 of chapter 43. It says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am naturally an idealist. I, I have ideals how life is supposed to work. And when we lose our ideals, when we start to lose a vision for what God is wanting to do, even in the face of what is really happening around us, which would be realism, the way that life really is, what is really happening around us, we don't really have to lose our idealism for what it is that God is wanting to do, for what God can do, because God is always wanting to refine our idealism, even in the middle of a painful, broken, hurting world, and that we would never lose sight of what Christ is doing in this world. Even in the book of Revelations at the end of the Bible, it's all about idealism. It's all about recapturing our idealism. And if it doesn't happen in the world, it's going to happen one day, whether it's then in heaven. What we are is we get to be engaged in the idealistic conclusion of all of history. For some of us, the reality of our present life is is very hard and we don't feel like we can be idealists anymore. Even if nothing changes in our lives, whether in our families or churches or in the country and the world around us, we don't have to lose our idealism because we are still a part of the master plan of God that is leading to an amazing and unbelievable conclusion. Sometimes we measure success only by the small slice uh, that we see around us. But Paul, he was a person who always had the big picture in mind. Even when he's wrestling with things that were going on in his life, when he was wrestling with what is happening in the church, he, through his own sufferings, through the church struggles, he never lost a vision for what it was that was really going on And he never lost that perspective. When he was in jail, when he was not doing well in the church, that was very conflicted. He's always moving into the churches. He's always writing letters. He's always encouraging. He's so optimistic. He's saying, God is doing something that is amazing. Let's never lose that focus. My hope is that we can gain some of our idealism back today. Just some. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Can you not perceive it? This verse that this comes out of, out of a passage in Isaiah, it is, uh, it's part of a story of the people of Israel. After they were conquered, they were sent to Babylon as captives. Isaiah, who is writing this, he's writing this passage several hundred years before they're ever taken captive and sent to Babylon. But he's writing it as if it's already happened. And he's already breathing vision into a very destructive and disappointing and confusing situation that is going to happen. I think it's so interesting because if God is already writing optimistically about something that's going to happen in a few hundred years, something that is very destructive and disappointing and very defeating to the people of Israel, if he's already optimistic about that, does he... Doesn't he know what he's doing, even today for us right now? Does he not know where things are going? When I was in college, I was first introduced to some art and design. And uh, where when you look at it, you knew exactly what it was you were seeing. I thought it was obvious to see. I could tell exactly what the picture was when I saw it. And uh, But the, the problem is underlying that, there was another picture, kind of the exact flip side. And the most classic is of uh, this old lady and a young woman, where the young woman is kind of looking away shyly, uh, very demurely. And and, and if you look long enough and if you can get the right perception, you can see this older lady in the picture instead. When I would look at them, I would just be staring. I'd be so intense, just trying to look. I'd blur my eyes. I'd go back. I'd go forward. I'm trying to figure out how can I see them. I need trying to look for these differences. And then people would cry out, I got it. I got it. And I'm like, oh, I'm not getting it. I'm just still staring at this thing. And finally, I would adjust it and I could see it. And I could see the old woman, and then I'd have a hard time finding the young woman. In our text today, he says, See, I'm doing a new thing. 
Can you perceive it? Can you adjust your mind? Can you adjust your worldview and your understanding and your idea about theology, what you've come to understand about God, what you need to understand about God? Can you align yourself in such a way so that you can see what it is I'm wanting to do? For us to be able to see what God is doing, there are three shifts that need to occur, especially when it doesn't seem like maybe it's not always apparent that God is doing anything around us. The very first shift that has to occur, that needs to occur, is to not focus on the captors, but on the Creator. Not the captors, but the Creator. A few verses before uh, the one that we read where it says, See, I'm doing a new thing. Before that, just a few verses previous in chapter 43, verse 14, it says, This is what the Lord says, Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians and the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator your king. I don't want you to focus on the Babylonians, not the captors, not the people who moved you into a difficult, oppressive situation. Not those people, not the captors, but the creator, because I'm going to do worse to the Babylonians than they ever did to you. I have the power. I have the ability to do it. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. You are never in a situation that I cannot get you out of if I want to get you out of it. How bad was it to be held captive by the Babylonians? How nasty was it really? Because I can tell you it was worse for them than anything that we've ever gotten ourselves into. I, I, that's what I think. I, I don't, I mean, to be taken as a captive and to be brought to another land, to be oppressed, to be a fugitive, unable to go back to your homeland, to not having any hope, I think that would be a very difficult, hard thing. But it says in the text, I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what's going on. I'm going to take the Babylonians captive. I'll step in and put them in the exact same spot that you are in. And I'm going to bring you back because I'm your creator. I'm your king and I'm not out of control. And I think sometimes we can get enemy fixated. In World War I and World War II, people used to fly uh, the, fighter, the fighter planes and the bombers. Sometimes as they're coming in to destroy the ships that were out in the ocean, the pilot would uh, get enemy fixated where they would, uh, the pilot would try to bring the plane in so close so that they could fire on the ship, try and take that ship out so that either they could shoot or their gunner could shoot, that they would come in so close that they would be able, that they couldn't pull out of the, the dive soon enough because they were so fixated on trying to take that ship out that they would lose the ability to save and protect themselves. Enemy fixation is when they couldn't pull that throttle back in time because they're so focused on that target, on destroying that target where they couldn't get out of the nosedive and they would crash right into the ship or right into the ocean. Sometimes we can give a lot of attention to the enemy, to the devil, to Satan, to demons. 25, 30 years ago, roughly, we were, as a, as a culture, we were in a desperate need for some theology on spiritual oppression. And so we started to hear a lot more about it. Books started to be written and it was all wonderful. It was really good stuff. We needed that information for where we were in, our, in the Christian culture at that time. But alongside that, such an emphasis was put on spiritual oppression that some people were not able to process healthily and how to have a healthy perspective on how to deal with spiritual oppression. And it became like enemy fixation. C.S. Lewis said, there are two equal and opposite errors in which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The devils are equally pleased with both errors. Some of us, we, some of us, we just get frustrated and we start to look around the world around us and we just say, how is it that they don't believe in the supernatural forces that are at play right here? They're so vulnerable. And then we become preoccupied with spiritual warfare and spiritual oppression. And God says, I do want you to know that is a piece of the equation. It's a very important piece of the equation, but it's not the most important piece. It's the creator. 
Most of our information about spiritual warfare in the Bible comes from Paul. Jesus does do a lot of spiritual uh, confrontation, but he didn't do a lot of the teaching. Paul is the one, the one where we get all of the teaching out of and instruction. And Paul gives us more information about how to deal with how to, how to battle Satan and how to go after spiritual oppression. How to deal with the enemy. And when Paul uses the word adversary or uh, Satan or devil or any word that would refer to Satan, he refers to it about 20 times in total through his writings. In the book of Ephesians alone, though, there are over 20 references to Christ in the first chapter. It is so important that we keep our perspective on what is the most important thing. Christ. Paul is continually coming back and pointing to Christ over and over and over and over again as the most important thing. 500 years ago, Martin Luther, he used to get enemy fixated. I love it. I love it when I read about classic uh, old saints that would struggle and wrestle in their faith. And Martin Luther and even Spurgeon uh, and even other great theologians, they struggled with depression. Martin Luther would get so frustrated at his depression and his just feeling this oppression that sometimes he would take his inkwell and he would just throw it at the wall trying to say, Satan! I'm trying to get you get out of here and he would just smash it against the wall just mad yelling at Satan to leave him alone he just lived with a sense of oppression that was so heavy on him that one day he was really struggling with it and his wife Catherine saw him she is a fantastic wife and she saw him struggling with this depression and this fixation on the enemy she went and she put on this black hooded uh, cloak and she came back and it's a it was a cloak of mourning she came to his office where he was studying and she started walking back and forth in his room right in front of him God is dead God is dead God is dead and she was just saying this over and over and his Martin just was what are you doing and he turns to his wife saying that is nonsense God is not dead and then she turned to him and like a fantastic wife said then why don't you live like it and act like it ouch sometimes our spouses have the ability to really snap us out of things maybe in a way that we didn't want to be snapped out of but needed to be snapped out of why don't you quit preaching this stuff and get some perspective that it's not the captor it is the creator God says See, I am doing a new thing. Stay focused on that. I want you to see that. I want you to perceive that. I want you to look for that. Genesis 3.15 says that God did not come to battle Satan, but to crush his head. Then in 1 John 3, it says that the reason the Son of God came was to destroy the works of the devil. Romans 6.20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. There is no question about how hard it is, about what the attitude of the enemy is, about what they are wanting to do. We will soon crush his head under our feet, just as Jesus crushed his head. He will bruise your heel and we will crush his head. We will do the same thing that Jesus did and as we focus on the Creator and our King. The next shift that needs to occur is not the focus on the past, but on the future. Back in verse 16, it says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the enemy and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. And I go, well, what story is this that he's talking about? Well, we know it's the story of Moses now that Isaiah is referring back to, where he's crossing the Red Sea and where Pharaoh and the army were coming after him. They're rushing down on them on the Red Sea, and they're going to try and wipe them out, trying to snuff them out like a wick. This is the greatest story for the Israelites as a people in the entire Old Testament. There is no greater story in their history. It is their deliverance from Egypt, having been held captive for 400 years. This is the pinnacle of good news for them as a people. Every bad thing that has ever happened to them, 
they seem to be able to weather it and suffer through because you know what? We remember how great our God is. We know that he has been, we have been through worse. He has brought us out. God can save us. We know that he is the, our salvation. He is the one who redeems us as a people. God can do it. Have you ever told anyone they need to forget a Bible story? That's what he said. This is what froze up. Have you ever told anyone to forget a Bible story? That's what it says here. Remember this great story of Moses? I want you to remember it about the deliverance of our people. And then he goes on to write, but you're stuck in that story. We do need to remember it and then forget it. It is a great story, but you don't seem to think that anything else good is going to happen. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Let go of the Bible story. It's a good one, but let it go. Because God wants to do something new. And we need to be ready. And we need to be looking forward. We need to be ready for what it is He wants to do next. Something new that is going to happen in your life. People were in Egypt for 400 years. Generation after generation after generation, they came and they went without seeing anything that was going to happen of what God was going to do. But was God still on top of the situation even though generation after generation came and went? There are times in the history of the church when generation after generation has come and gone and nothing good happened in the church. And then an explosive thing happened where God breaks in and a fresh move of God happens. It doesn't always happen in our lifetime. It doesn't always happen in our lifetime. We're idealists for the big picture, not for our own little time frame, for our own life, for what is what we want to see happen right now, but for God's history throughout all of ages. When we get focused on our little picture and our own situation, we can lose perspective, not the past of what might have happened, what God has done, but the future. It's all about what God is wanting to do next. When I was growing up, there was a wall between us and Russia. You literally had the Berlin Wall and, and this fence that would run through the entire country of Germany to keep us out or to keep them in. And before the Iron Curtain came down, Christians thought, that the gospel is not able to penetrate that land. It's not able to penetrate the people who are behind that. And then we were all stunned when we saw country after country after country start to pull away in 1989 and 90. Peter Kuznick was a guy who worked at the former Yugoslavian. Uh, he was the president of the Evangelical Theological College in Yugoslavia, the former country. It was a evangelical kind of outpost in inside of this communist country and he went to the World Congress of Evangelism in Manila and it was the summer of 1989 and he started to speak about this vision that he had for educating Christians whether it be evangelists or pastors or teachers or people who would be ready so that when and if the the Iron Curtain ever crumbled in Eastern Europe they would be ready he said when it happens I want us trained and ready he had a vision and it seemed like this really noble vision really powerful vision and the Congress uh, they kind of backed him but they said but because the press of government is uh, that they were under we're not really sure it's going to happen it's really hard to support you on this but within four months the winds of freedom swept through the Eastern Bloc countries and it started to open up all of the doors to the gospel and our jaws dropped that it happened so he's telling people he's got this vision but other people, they weren't very optimistic about it happening. In January of 1990, a year later, Peter spoke again to the Fellowship of Evangelical Seminary Presidents here in the United States. And when asked about the cataclysmic event and the happenings in the Eastern Europe, he answered, he said, never put a period where God has a comma. Our lives and in our ministries, as we're reaching out to people, as we're trying to share God's love with other people, never put a period where God has a comma. 
take a look at what God has done in your own life. And, and we could even just look at what God has done in our own church where God has done impossible things. Even, even if it doesn't happen in our lives, Peter Kuznick would still say, it's going to happen. And when it happens, I'm at least going to be getting things ready so that when it happens, we're prepared because I'm working for the big picture. Big picture. Never put a period where God has put a comma. Not the past, but the future. It has been said that the greatest enemy to the move of God are those that are a part of the past move of God. Some of us look back at the way that it was. Some of uh, our parents look back to the way that it was. Where each generation, they start to look forward to the, the future generations and wonder, can they really do it? Can they really carry the weight? Can they shoulder this? Can they carry the church? Is it really going to be like we have done? Because I don't see them connecting like how I connected to God. They're not doing church like I did church. They're not playing the right music. They're not worshiping God how, hmm, really, I know the best worship of, because that's how I connect to God, how I really like to worship. But the reality is that God is raising up young people right now, even in our own community, someone who's going to understand the shifts of what is happening in the culture around us and they're going to be able to speak God's truths and his glory into it not the past but the future tell our youth that you believe in them pour your heart into young people pour your heart into the lives of the youth and into children I remember when I was 17 years old I remember I remember the man who looked in my eyes and he just looked at me and he said it. And I respected this man so much. And he looked me in the eye and he told me, I believe in you. That was the first time I think, at least I remember anyone telling me they believed in me. I believe in you and I think you can lead. My head just spun. I, I, had, I had no idea how to respond and I, I struggled to even know if I could believe in that. But I started to hear it more and more. And it started to sink in. There is power in telling someone that you believe in them. Those that are leaders, and the reality is every single one of us is a leader. Because a leader is someone who has influence. Every single one of us have people in our lives that we influence, that we shape. We are leaders. Where we are to take people who are part of the future and to empower and release them. So that God can do a whole new thing through them without second guessing how God's going to use them. Don't ask young people to be preaching or leading worship the way that we do it. That's not what we're wanting. We're not wanting to replicate what it is that we do right now. Let people do it the way that they want to do it. We need to release them to do it, to adjust to their strategy of, through, of God's kingdom, of how they're going to implement it. Yes, we do need to be able to teach people good, solid theology, but we need the, the message to be able to go out in the format that they want it to be able to go. And we've got to let go. And we need to release. And we need to believe in people. Bring on the next generation, not the past, but the future. Prior to 1906, football was a running game. Many of us maybe don't remember that. Uh, kind of, that was a while ago, 1906. It, it, it was a ground game. There was no forward pass prior to 1906. And suddenly, with a flick of a wrist, you could gain 40 yards and gain a touchdown. But what was the attitude at the time to people, uh, of people and teams who had never heard of it? They had never thought of it. They had never used it. They didn't know anything about the forward pass. It was this brand new thing. And now they're like, it's because football is a running game, but now you can throw it? Ah, <laughs> ah what are you going to do with that play? I mean, really, uh, that's kind of a last-ditch effort kind of play. That's just not right. That's not how we play the game. We don't even, we, we've never practiced it. We don't know how to use it. We don't know how to train for it. I'm not really sure what it would be for. So here's what we'll do. We're going to reserve the forward pass for a last desperate measure when we're three touchdowns behind. And we need to make something happen. Maybe then we'll try the forward pass. Because it's a high-risk move. 
it's cool that it's been introduced, but I mean, we're not going to use it unless we have no other choice because football is a running game. It's the way it was. It's the way it should always be. So we reserve the pass, maybe for the end of the game. But that year, St. Louis University shifted their offense from a running game to a passing game. And they started to develop passes and, and passing plays because they saw that this is the future of football. That year, they outscored their opponents with a season total uh, score of 402 to 11. They dominated the sport that year. They dominated and no one had any clue how to stop them from walking all over them because that team had adopted the forward pass before anyone else. Right now in the church, and always in the church, God is introducing the forward pass. And we need to see it. We need to receive it. We need to believe it. God is introducing the forward pass into our church saying, I want to do a new thing. I'm always wanting to do a new thing, a new way of doing ministry. Because churches die when they don't adopt the forward pass. Several years ago, our church, the Bridge Church, we wondered if we had a period instead of a comma in the history of our church. But then there were people that started to rise up and leaders inter that, that, that were introduced and they started to introduce the forward pass into our church and into our community. And people started coming back to the church with a vision that God had been calling them, releasing them to use the forward pass. And our church was ready to receive it. And I'm still so optimistic about what our future is going to be in, in our community. The last shift that needs to occur to be able to receive what God is doing is not the desert, but the stream. Isaiah tells the people, I want to tell you a new story of deliverance. Immediately, he starts talking about the deserts. So in 40, chapter 43, verse 19, it says, See, I am doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not perceive it? And the people are thinking, God, don't you see where we are, though? I mean, can you not see where we are? We're in Babylon. We are hundreds of miles away from our homeland. And between us and Jerusalem is a huge desert. And maybe the Babylonians, maybe they had the resources. They were able to bring us across and carry us across safely through the desert. But there are no camels. There are no carts that are going to be able to take us back. There's not enough food. We don't have the water. We don't have what it takes for us to survive going across that desert. We can't just walk there, Isaiah. We can't just do that. We can't just go back to Jerusalem. Then Isaiah says, I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. He's saying, I don't want you to be intimidated by the desert. I don't want you to be worried about finding water because I have animals there that I provide for and they are worshiping me every day because I provided for them. I'm not stuck. I'm not unable to move you through the desert. In our lives, we're either in a desert or we're about to be in a desert. Every single one of us. That's just the reality. Either we're in one or a desert is coming. Always. I thought I could just hold my breath long enough and maybe I'd survive and get through it. That maybe if I could just wait it out. But the reality is, I will always be in a desert or I'll be coming into a new desert. Every experience in our life, though, is used for a divine purpose. Have you ever been through a desert in your life? Yes. Have you ever experienced streams of refreshment? Yeah. Well, maybe it was a person that came into your life that encouraged you, or you heard a song on a Sunday morning that just sparked your heart in a way that maybe it hadn't been sparked before in quite a while. And every time you sang that song, it just flooded you with emotions as you're connecting to the heart of God and you felt God's presence and God's joy. 
God will always find a way to move, to work in a way, but it doesn't, but it doesn't, we don't always know how it's going to happen or where it's going to come from. We're not sure where he's going to move and we can't always see where it's going to be coming. But God will make a way for me. He will be my guide and he will keep me close by his side. God will make a way because God always makes a way. Sometimes it's a book that maybe you come across that helps you regain perspective on your faith and in your journey, on God's work inside of kind of this dark, painful, dry season in your life. Sometimes it's a sermon. Sometimes it's rereading the Bible and where, where you're just soaking in the words and you're rereading the words and you're meditating on them and suddenly it just kind of explodes in with meaning and purpose and it's just this stream of encouragement and refreshment. God says, I make streams in your life today. I move people into the desert and I do not leave them stranded there. I wrote this letter to you even before you ended up there as captives. I knew you were going to lose perspective. <laughs> and I was going to help you regain it. I knew that. I'm not caught off guard in your life. You can stay in the desert a long time as long as you have a stream to go to. Sometimes we just move from stream to stream to stream to stream until we get out of the desert. And that's kind of the way that God has planned it. So really, what has this even been about today? It's about perspective. God has not lost his way in your life. Can you see that? I am doing a new thing in your lifetime, after your lifetime. You're a part of the big picture. You will stand one day in the middle of a big picture and your chapter will stand as a part of the big story, whatever that chapter is. So write it well and write it faithfully, whether it's successful or painful, discouraging, but write your chapter well. Some people write the first chapter very well, but then the end was such a bad chapter. We need to revive the vision again because we are writing a chapter and it's a part of the big picture, but we get to write even that last chapter and we need to write our last chapter as well. Some of us think that we have to get a bunch of things done before we'll be in a place where we can start to love others and do ministry. What we need to do is we need to change the way that we think and function in the kingdom and in the church as we deal with the heartache and loss and grief and pain and challenges, but also the opportunities because God is wanting to do a new thing in us. And I don't know what this next move is going to be, but it will start with God. And what we are doing now will faithfully set the stage for what is going to happen next. So we get to run the race and we get to write the chapter. We get to wait for God to see what God is going to do. And God asks us, don't lose perspective. I want you to keep perspective. I want you to see I am doing a new thing. <laughs> really? Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Change the way you think. Not the captor, but the creator. Not the past, but the future. Not the desert, but the stream. Take time to register what is going on in your life and in your heart today. And if, if you're with someone, I would encourage you to just take a few moments to just pray with them and pray over them and seal a blessing and encouragement onto them. I just want to close in prayer. Father, we need to go out of here believing what you have said about yourself in the text like this. And we confess we confess to you that we sometimes lose our way, sometimes very easily. We confess that we can slip off of this edge so quickly and we don't always perceive what you are doing, but we usually get stuck seeing only what is obvious. So this morning we need you to change the way that we think. We need you to assist us into moving toward a renewed mind. If we're going to run this race well in life, in loving you and in serving you. 
So I ask for a new work in our lives that begins with a new way of thinking. Amen. Again, sign up on our Get on our email list and we'll keep you up to date with information as changes happen in our church and when we'll start meeting together and how we're going to gather. So have a great day. Thanks.